Things off today for Georgia. And the first pitch misses outside. Our home plate umpire, Marty Abbasesian. Up the first baseline, Matt Dial and Phil Friels over at third. And Dallas Goodnight had one of those home runs that we were talking about, which is more rare for her. She had that yesterday. It was a grand slam. Her first home run of the season came up with the bases loaded and hit it out of here. Stephanie Schoonover coming off her fourth complete game in her last five starts. And that was not the case earlier in the year, Amanda. Her head coach, Rachel Lawson, was limiting her innings a little bit due to the injury she suffered last season, a stress fracture in her throwing arm. And early in SEC play, Schoonover went to her head coach and said, I'm used to throwing more, coach. I'm ready. And that is what has been common now over the last couple of weeks for the Kentucky Ace. Well, in Kentucky coming into the season, they were really proud of and excited about their deep pitching staff. They brought in a transfer, Jaden Vickers. She's been throwing a lot of pitches going deep into these games. Yeah, 181 pitches thrown against Alabama. It seems like she'll work deep into counts, a lot of foul balls. High hopper over the head of the third baseman, Lorsung, and no play on the speedy Dallas Goodnight, who is aboard. Good job by Dallas Goodnight to hit with two strikes and just pound that ball into the ground. I mean, it's just perfectly placed. There is absolutely nothing that you can do on the left side of the Kentucky infield with this. Even an All-American like Aaron Koffel there at shortstop, you have no play. And now Sidney Chambly. Runner takes off. It is good night sliding in without a tag. We had seven stolen bases in game one between Georgia and Kentucky. None in game two and already good night in scoring position here. Nobody down in the top of the first. And of course, Carissa Hamilton back behind the plate. It's a new look for Kentucky this year with Kayla Kowalik, who was a mainstay back there for Kentucky in her career. And so Carissa Hamilton getting a lot of opportunities to take that spot and growing a lot this year. Coach Lawson said of Hamilton, just has been a sponge, has learned a lot with the in-game experience that she's gotten as opposed to last year playing behind Koala. And having to contend this weekend with a lot of speed at the top of the Georgia lineup with Goodnight and Chambly. And Amanda, both teams all throughout the year really have been figuring out who sits best in the leadoff spot. And Dallas Goodnight riding a five-game hit streak since moving from the nine to the leadoff. Yeah, feeling comfortable there. And she's kind of more your prototypical leadoff hitter. Has the speed, can steal bases right away like she did there, and just really kind of put the pressure on Kentucky or whoever they're playing right away. And love to see that if you're a Georgia fan. Her find a way to get a hit with two strikes to start off this game and then immediately put her emotion and into scoring position for the big bats of Georgia in the middle of their lineup. Another full count. And one thing that you notice too, Matt, when looking at Schoonover's stats is her batting average against her with left-handed hitters is about 150 points higher than right-handed hitters. Lefties have more success off of her. Chambly, a flare into left field, and it is caught by Riley Smith, one down. On that graphic, who were not starters last year. And then you add in Riley Smith as well, who was sort of in and out of that starting lineup. There's still a lot of newness with this Kentucky team. Jada Kearney at the plate for Georgia. And a line drive will get off the glove of the shortstop, Koffel, and no play at either base. Kearney is aboard with a base hit. And Kearney had actually backed off the plate a little bit, Kearney being a right-handed hitter, understanding what Schoonover is trying to do to her, is work that screwball, that rise ball up and in her hands, gave herself space on the inner half, hit that ball hard to the left side, but the veteran of Koffel doing a good job of knocking that ball down, keeping it more on the infield to 
keep Goodnight from scoring. And now Jaden Goodwin in the cleanup spot with two on and one down in the first inning. And remember, whoever has scored first in this series to this point has gone on to win the game. Georgia trying to avoid three consecutive SEC series losses. And they've all been tight. We had them last weekend against Tennessee. They lost the rubber match there. And then a surprising loss to many people in game three at home against Arkansas the weekend prior to the Tennessee series. It's just, you know, Matt, it's just so hard to win on the road in the SEC. I mean, it's hard to win Period. one game yeah. in a series, nevertheless, <laughs> win a series. And for Georgia, they've been on the road back-to-back -back weekends at first place Tennessee last weekend and then here in Lexington. That is a big-time strikeout by Stephanie Schoonover, two down. She needed that, and Kentucky needed that. It is one of the best things that you can do is put the game into your own hands, gets this chase that is well out of the zone by Goodwin, had screw movement and rise ball to movement to it. But that second out, so important with the runner in scoring position, that runner over there at third base in the inning. Sarah Mosley, who homered yesterday. And you said something interesting, Amanda, a feel thing for you. You feel like when Sarah Mosley's been going well, that's when this team is at its best. We've seen Kentucky a good amount, excuse me, we've seen Georgia a good amount of times lately. And it just seems like when Sarah Mosley is feeling it in the box, the rest of the Georgia hitters feed off of her. Usually, Hitty likes to hit in that two spot in the lineup this weekend. Tony Baldwin, Georgia's head coach, has moved her, her down gradually in game one. It was a little bit further down than two, and then now she's hitting in the, the fifth spot. I think it just takes a little bit of pressure off of her, but you think about what Sarah Mosley has done in her career here. She is at the tops in a lot of categories in Georgia career history, home runs, RBI, always a threat to leave the ballpark. Second on the team this year with 12 homers. And to your point, went 0 for 1 in game one in the three spot. Tony Baldwin moved her down to the five in game two, and she was two for four with a home run. The one two from Schoonover. Dallas Goodnight reached with an infield single to lead things off, and Jada Kearney. Reach first on another infield single. Runners at the corners. And a 2-2 strikeout of Sarah Moses. And the Kentucky starting lineup. We told you George has made a lot of changes with their lineup, particularly at the leadoff spot. Kentucky's been doing the same thing this year. Aaron Koffel sliding from the leadoff to the two. And Riley Smith batting leadoff now. Takes strike one in the series four for eight with two stolen bases and a run batted in. And again, you referenced Kayla Kowalik, the legend who graduated after last season from the University of Kentucky, had been their leadoff hitter for what felt like forever. And as you get a look at Kowalik there, it's been a process of figuring out who can slot into the top of this order. Line drive off the glove of the shortstop Armistead and into left field. And the leadoff runner is aboard for the Wildcats. And Riley Smith is making a case for herself this weekend for Rachel Lawson to keep her here in the leadoff spot. Sits back on this changeup so well, barrels it up toward the left side. Riley Smith, that is her fifth hit of the weekend. Two for four on Friday, two for four on Saturday, and leads off the game and gets on for Aaron Koffel. Fifth year senior is aboard now for another senior and Aaron Koffel. And she gets beam. First two batters aboard now for Kentucky. A lot of offense in game one and game two. And as we mentioned at the top of the show, we expect no different today with both of these teams seeing each other a lot. Good offenses on both sides. And again, the wind is just whipping around 
headed from or toward left field. Ball could be flying a lot today and make it tough in the air. Taylor Ebbs has homered in this series. See the big wrap around the right side of her torso. Had been the starting right fielder, but due to injury has been limited to just playing at the plate, but she's done a pretty darn good job there. Ebbs, as I mentioned, is homered in this series, but she's three for seven and has hit 339 since moving to the DP spot. It's always a question, Matt, of who's going to hit behind the best hitter in your lineup. And you know that Erin Koffel is going to get pitched around. She's going to get pitched really tough. So you want somebody behind her who can make the team pay for working to get to her. Up the middle and in the center. Here comes Smith. And the throw will get cut off. The Wildcats strike first in game three. Just putting some things together in this first inning and sitting back on a changeup again is Taylor Ebbs. That's more up in the zone. Madison Kerpix has given up two hits in this inning, both on one of her best pitches. Her changeup seems a little bit more up in the zone. A good two strike RBI for Taylor Ebbs it makes Kerpix pay. Still nobody out. And two on for the freshman, Peyton Plotz. Shelby Walters is getting loose in the Georgia pen. We have seen her once in the series in relief. And to our surprise, did not start game three today. It's been very effective for this Georgia staff, particularly in the Tennessee series. Gave the Bulldogs chances to win in all three games. And now Lily Backus up and warming as well. And usually what Georgia will do is throw at least two pitchers a game. Sometimes you'll see all three with Kerpix, Walters, and then the lefty, Lily Backus, who's now warming up as well with Walters. Watts fouls off the one-two, and there goes Amanda Scarborough's laptop. <laughs> right into our perch <laughs> behind home. Oh, man. It's pretty new, too. I really thought that was going to miss us. Oh, look at the, you can see where it hit. Yeah. You see? You have insurance for that? Of course, I didn't get it this time. Isn't that how it always goes? Two two count, two on in the bases, two on and nobody out rather for the Wildcats. <laughs> now, you've get, now you've got the reflexes. <laughs> well, I was looking down at something, then all of a sudden I see the ball head in the same trajectory towards us. That doesn't happen all too often. No. You know? I was not anticipating that. And I did not do a good job of blocking your laptop. <laughs> you did. I don't know. Two, two misses low and a full count to Peyton Plotz. For the record, though, I was never an elite <laughs> softball player. You were good at wiffle ball, though. <laughs> Backyard doesn't count. Here's the payoff <laughs> from Kerpix. Line drive right into the mid of the third baseman, Mosley, and they almost doubled up Ebbs at first base, but that is a big first out with two on and nobody out, and both runners will stay put. Well, and I'm sure Sarah Mosley was hoping that that ball was not caught on a line drive. I'm sure she was hoping that she caught it on the short hop because this would have been a double play. You see, she immediately goes to step on third and then throw across the diamond, but she barely caught that one in the air, and it kept Georgia getting two outs. Grace Larson, who has homered in this series, gets hit on the arm. Second hit batter of the inning, and the bases are loaded for. Going to put in a pinch hitter here with Allie Hutchins. Hutchins. 
Hutchins one for five with the bases loaded this season. Pinch hitting for Jenna Blanton. It's a better location right there for Kerpix with her changeup. Right now, Kentucky looks like they have a great game plan against Kerpix. She needs to make more pitches like that with her changeup in order to try to get out of the center and only giving up one run. Well, this is starting to look like game one from Kentucky's point of view. They were so good at manufacturing runs. Seven runs on nine hits. Two singles, a stolen base, and a walk in the first inning of that game. And Hutchins delivers a line drive to right, caught by Kearney. Here comes Koffel from third, and it's 2-0 Wildcats in the bottom of the first. You know, the freshmen on this Kentucky team have been incredibly impactful. Coach Lawson brings the freshman off the bench with a runner at third base, less than two outs, and that's exactly what she's looking for from Allie Hutchins. Put the ball in the outfield, score us another run. Kentucky up by two now. And Carissa Hamilton at the plate with two on and two down. It's interesting, this Kentucky team has been in it in a lot of big games. Of course, they won their first SEC series of the season against Alabama. And with a win here today, it would be their second SEC series win, a team that is currently just outside the top 25 in the RPI. Records can be deceiving in this league. Both of these teams have played difficult schedules. They've really tested themselves. And both figure to be players in the NCAA tournament. Of course, Georgia, they have made no bones about it. They are playing to host a Super Regional. That is a goal for this Georgia team. And for Kentucky, with a 10-game over 500 record, and the strength of schedule that they've had, Amanda, squarely in the NCAA tournament conversation. Well, and their SEC schedule has been so difficult. In the SEC, you don't play everybody in softball. It's different every single year. So their hand that they were dealt this year is one of the toughest schedules you can have. And a 3-1 walk drawn by Carissa Hamilton. Inning continues for Margaret Tobias. And Kerpix have struggled to find the zone. Two hit batters and a walk, and here comes Tony Baldwin. First, it's Rachel Lawson making the change. We are going to have a pinch hitter in the eighth spot. Kentucky threatening again with the bases loaded. And again, in games one and two, the team to score first went on to win that game. Outlasting furious comeback attempts. Kentucky doing that in game one, Georgia in game two. Reasoner this season 0 for 4 with the bases loaded, but she is 2 for 6 as a pinch hitter. And Rachel Lawson has pulled the right strings this year as Walters is ahead in the count one and two. Saw Shelby Walters enter into one of the Tennessee games and just totally changed the momentum towards Georgia's favor in that game last weekend. Has the ability to do the same thing here. Kind of a slower start for her picks, and I think that's why you see Coach Baldwin make that change so quickly. A lot of confidence with how Walters is throwing right now. Kentucky had bases loaded, one out. They have scored two runs so far. The one-two is a flare right back to Walters, and she comes in, and in five pitches, closes this is A&M. But great to see all those stars back together, and a big night in Tuscaloosa. And I know you're excited for that documentary to release. I just got goosebumps watching that, and I've, I think I've even seen it like four or five times <laughs> at this point, uh, just watching that promo for it. but covering that the first SEC National Championship won 
by Alabama are brought to the conference. I should say, of course, Jackie Trina, a big part of that, but just a complete team effort when you think of that 2012 team that won it all for Alabama. And I love that they do it upright. They do a lot of really great things for female athletes and for women's sports at Alabama. And that premiere last night looked like an all out blast to celebrate that team. So you have seen it four times and it's not yet public. No, I haven't seen the actual show. Oh, okay. I've just You've seen, seen the promo, the promo four it. times. I say, haven't gotten your, to see it. Who's Amanda Scarborough's plug on getting the private releases? <laughs> That's a ground ball up the middle. And Sarah Gordon and Chip. It's also mic'd up Monday. It is. Yeah, it's a big weekend there in Tuscaloosa. A couple of games on ESPN2, and then the mic'd up Monday, and the premiere, and then they had the big celebration in the theater last night. Tuscaloosa Tuscaloosa is the place to be this weekend. Here is Sid Kuma, and she gets beamed upstairs. So the first two batters aboard for Georgia in the second inning. Stephanie Schoonover has hit quite a few people this year. That's actually her 24th hit by pitch because, as we mentioned, she's a screwball, rise ball pitcher. So against right-handed hitters, she's going to work more inside, up and out of their hands. A lot of her hit by pitches look a little bit like that. So two on and nobody out for Emily Digby, who has been one of the hottest hitters in this Georgia lineup. Has homered in the series and has been a bit of a revelation towards the bottom of the lineup for Tony Baldwin. 20 runs batted in this year after she started very slowly to SEC play, getting her feet wet as a true freshman. She's looked good the past couple of weekends, just settling in right to that eight spot. This Georgia team overall is a very veteran team. A lot of seniors, a lot of players that have started since they set foot on campus. And so you come in as a freshman, you're just trying to find your place. But she's had a couple of big swings in this Kentucky series, as well as going back to last weekend. She was a big bulk of their offense in some close, tight games against Tennessee last weekend against good pitching. As Gordon in scoring position at second base. And the tying run at first in Sid Kuma. And if you're just joining us, Georgia had two on, one out in the first inning and was unable to score. Back to back strikeouts by Schoonover and she'll get strikeout number three here. One away in the second. I mean, look at Schoonover just bearing down with runners in scoring position already in this game. Three strikeouts with runners in scoring position. Two that you mentioned in the first inning. The hitters chase the pitch way out of the zone. And this one, Digby takes that curveball that just paints the outside corner. Schoonover stepping up. And now Ellie Armistead in the nine spot. Some defensive changes for Rachel Lawson. Cassie Reisner into the game at second base. To She's never easy to play here. Well, you speak to the wind. It is blowing out rapidly to left field today. It has been since we started. It's that wind from Augusta, Georgia. It's just <laughs> headed on up here to us, huh? It caused havoc at the Masters. Right now, 10 mile per hour winds. We've seen it as high as 18 since the start of the game. And left field just seems to be a power alley here at John Crop Stadium. We saw a 300 foot home run to left by Aaron Koffel earlier in the series. Three and one count to Ellie Armistead. Well, in each game, I feel like the weather has been so different. On Friday, I think the feels like temperature was in the 40s and it was windy. And then here you are today, 75. Armistead a flare into left. Back on it is Smith and she will make the catch. Both runners will stay put for Georgia two away. And you mentioned it before and again, we saw Georgia just last weekend, but 
It's just been what Georgia has done when they've gotten runners on that has seemed to just hold back their offense. It's not getting runners on base via a walk or a hit or a hit by pitch. It's getting them over and getting them in. That's caused this Georgia offense some issues the past couple of weekends. Trying run at first and Sid Kuma as Dallas Goodnight takes ball one. Good night, riding a five game hit streak since moving from the nine slot to the leadoff. And she does have a grand slam in the series, her first home run of the year. And she's just so dynamic because Dallas Goodnight can give you a couple of different looks when you're on defense. She can run through the box and more of a chop slap like she did in her first at bat, an infield single, and run through the box, take some steps, or she can keep her feet still like we're seeing here and swing away. And then he got in on the action with that powerful grand slam on Saturday. Takes the 2-1 to deep left field. Back on it is Smith, and she makes the catch a step in front of the wall and against pitchers in the SEC. Are they the best one-two punch in the SEC? It's Shelby Walters in the circle as we get Amanda Scarborough's microphone back working. A fly ball to center field is caught by Dallas Goodnight. And if you're just joining us, it was Madison Kerpix to start the game for Georgia. She was knocked out in the first. Shelby Walters came in and closed the door on the Wildcats with the bases loaded. And now Walters in the circle here in inning number two. She will take on the top of this Kentucky lineup with Riley Smith. Okay, I'm back. You're back, okay, good. Okay, first of all, whenever you go to talk into a microphone and you can't hear yourself and it's like not working, <laughs> it feels like one of those dreams where you're talking and nobody can hear you. Do you know what I'm talking zone. about? That's what it feels like. Um, but I do think that Tennessee's Pickens and Gottschall is the best one-two punch in the SEC and quite possibly the best one-two punch in the nation. We got to see him live and Pickens and Gottschall just looked phenomenal. By the way, is that your worst nightmare? You're talking clearly, and no one can hear you? Clearly, yeah. I've had several of those dreams as I feel like <laughs> a lot of people had but uh, or ha have had in the past. But they're off to such a great start. They really are. Gottschall and Pickens. And you know, they're playing in Starkville this weekend and Mississippi State run ruled them in game one, but then Tennessee came back big in game two, and they have the lead right now through six, six to three. But Mississippi State has been a very tough team in the SEC, picked to finish last, and right now they're in the middle of the standings. Look great. One, two to Smith. And then hopped into the top 25 in the rankings. Mississippi State at 16, actually. I feel like that's, it's been a while since I've seen Mississippi State rank that high. We'll see them in a couple of weeks in Columbia, Missouri. Which is another team that has surprised the times this year in the SEC slates. As Smith fights off the one, two. Missouri ranked in the top 15. It's course. just absurd. Yeah, the everybody. The amount of ranked teams in this league. And we had a chance to talk with Tony Baldwin. He feels strongly that, you know, if Ole Miss can get going a little bit in SEC play, we might see every SEC team make the NCAA tournament, which is as good as this league is and as long as you've covered it, still mind-blowing to me that every single team in the league has a shot to make the tournament. Well, then you look ahead to next year and adding Texas and yeah. Oklahoma to that. And so you had two more top 25 teams, two more top 10 teams into the SEC. Smith, a laser in the right field and down for a base hit. She's thinking two and dives in with a double. 
Riley Smith aboard for the second consecutive at bat of the day. <laughs> Riley Smith is just having so much fun playing the game this weekend. She is never going to want to leave this series. I don't think she wants to play Georgia at home every single weekend if she could because she has just gone off. This is back to back to back games with two hits for Riley Smith. Gets herself into second base and it's just been a spark for Kentucky. She's not going to want to leave the leadoff spot. That's Six right. Six hits in the series <laughs> as the leadoff. And here is Aaron Koffel, one of the most dangerous hitters in the country, with a runner in scoring position and a 2 0 lead for UK here in the bottom of the second. Coming off an All American season a year ago. Hasn't struck out very much this year. In fact, when you look at her home run numbers, oftentimes you see a player that strikes out a lot, but not Erin Koffel with the way that she's progressed in her Kentucky career. Just seven strikeouts on the year for Koffel as opposed to 32 walks. And that's, when you look at Erin Koffel and her numbers, you see all the home runs starting at her freshman and sophomore year carried throughout. But that's the biggest difference when you dive into the numbers is her patience at the plate and her ability to just own the strike zone. High pop up, edge of the infield. It's Sid Kuma for out number two. Now Taylor Epps. Your right fielder, number three, Taylor Epps. The speedy Riley Smith at second base with a two run lead. You see Taylor Epps, she just gets right on top of the plate. Just such a big presence in that left-handed batter's box. She gets more towards the front of the box, too. She's on the plate, more in the front, tries to take away that, that inside corner. And then, I mean, you got to give it to Walters for spotting that pitch up on the inner half like that. To be a right-handed pitcher and sneak one in like that against a left-handed hitter is so hard to do. And not too many right-handed pitchers can do that consistently. 0-2 from Walters. Just going right back in there. The game this weekend here in Lexington. Ebbs lays off the 0-2. Does have five runs batted in in the series. On four of eight hitting, singled and drove in a run back in the first. And launches this deep to right field. Back on it, Kearney, and it's gone. Taylor Ebb's second home run of the series, and it's 4 nothing Cats in the second. If you want to win games in the SEC, you have to be a team that makes in at bat adjustments. We showed you, or you saw it happen in earlier in her at bat. Shelby Walters was trying to own that inside corner, and then Ebbs makes an adjustment with two strikes, a one, two, two run home run for Taylor Ebbs to put Kentucky up by four. But that is just a veteran at bat. She knew what Walters was trying to do, and instead of shying, backing away from it with two strikes, she gets her barrel there to 70 miles an hour on the inner half. And it's so tough to do, and a beautiful piece of hitting by Ebbs. Just the second home run allowed by Shelby Walters since March 17th. She has been so good in relief as Delaney Sullivan comes to the plate for her first at bat of the game. Base is clear and two down and a 4 nothing lead for the Wildcats in the rubber match of this series. Well, Rachel Lawson told us in their series loss to Texas A&M last weekend, the bats were there for a large portion of that series. It was the fielding that cost them that series, they felt. 
It seems like their batch just really started to break open last weekend against A&M, especially with the power. And Kentucky is a team that has hit for decent power throughout the season. But look at last weekend and this weekend, they've just gone off with the fourth most home runs since we came back from that COVID break. And that's what Mathis Georgia team, this Georgia offense is known for, hitting the long ball, putting up a lot of runs. Tony Baldwin, before he was the head coach, he was hitting, even their hitting coach. And Georgia consistently being able to rake. The interesting thing, though, is that we have seen sort of a reversal of what we saw from Georgia in the non-conference now in SEC play. They've actually given up more home runs against conference opponents than they've hit, and that was not the case before SEC play started. And, of course, Amanda, a lot of that has to do with the pitchers that they're facing in the SEC, but make no mistake, they faced really tough pitching in the non-conference as well and simply just had more success. And it's just to seem like the home runs that their pitching staff have given up have come with runners on base in close games where the other team is the one getting that big swing, getting that big hit, and Georgia is having those opportunities but not doing it the way that they're capable of. So it, it is surprising to see that the home run number flip-flop with the number of home runs that they've given up compared to hit. But you know, too, that with this Georgia lineup and their experience at any moment that that can change and things can click for them. Chambly, a liner in the center. Sullivan puts it away, one down. Buddy will be tuning in to see the Indiana Fever select Caitlin Clark. I don't think there's anybody that really believes they would select anybody but Caitlin Clark after the collegiate career that she's had. And the folks in Indiana, I can tell you, are preparing for Caitlin Clark in a Fever uniform. As Jada Kearney swings through the 1-0. Jada Kearney known herself for hitting the long ball, 14 home runs this season. I had a chance to talk to her before last weekend's series against Tennessee, and I said, have you always been a home run hitter? And she said she hit her first home run at age nine. So the answer to that is yes. She has always been a home run hitter. Laser off the glove of Lorsing at third. And it will be an error on Grace Lorson. This ball was hit hard. It just didn't look like Grace Lorson saw it very well. Or it looked like, and I know what that's like, to see a line drive coming at you and you think that it's coming a lot harder than what it actually is. Kearney got a little bit more jammed on that pitch and Lorson thought it was going to get on her faster. So Kearney aboard now for Jaden Goodwin. Well, kind of going back to that conversation we had last half inning, the Texas A&M series, we saw Kentucky commit four errors in the field. Three of those were very costly, leading to runs in various games throughout that series. They've been cleaner here against Georgia to this point. Line drive into right and down in front of Riley Smith. And back-to-back -back runners aboard now for the Bulldogs with one down. When you talk to these coaches in the SEC, Matt, and you ask them, you know, what's it take to finish at the top of the SEC? What's it take to compete in the SEC? It's pitching and defense. They all go back to that. It's even with offense taking off and increasing with the amount of home runs and walks and hard hits that we've seen, each one of the coaches always fall back on pitching and defense being the biggest key. Mosley top three in the conference and runs batted in coming into the weekend. And she is a dangerous bat in this lineup. And as we talked about earlier in the game, has shuffled around to different positions this season in Tony Baldwin's lineup. 
but has done damage in this series in the five spot. Homered yesterday, part of a three home run day for Georgia. The one two from Schoonover. Wait. She's not chasing that pitch up at her eyes that, by the way, she can hit about 300 feet over left field fence. But sometimes I feel like her ability that she knows she can hit that pitch can get her into some trouble too, especially against better pitchers that have more movement, that have that later break, that she's anticipating that up and in pitch on her hands to stay at a spot. And instead, it just continues to rise out of the strike zone. Chased a rise ball back in her first at bat, struck out with the runner at third base. Has another chance here. Well, it was back in the first inning that Georgia had runners at the corners and one out. And then back to back strikeouts of Goodwin and Mosley for Stephanie Schoonover to end the inning. And then last inning, Georgia got the first two batters aboard, a single and a hit by pitch before Schoonover set down the side. So they have had chances in this game. More chances here, can they capitalize? Full count to Mosley. And Mosley fights off the payoff out of play. There's that pitch again, up and in on her hands, right at her eyes. Stephanie Stunover can really utilize that spot over and over and over again consistently with her screwball and her rise ball. Ninth pitch of the at-bat coming. Second time in the series that this Georgia team has faced Stephanie Schoonover. She pitched a complete game in the game one victory. Seven innings, gave up five runs on five hits. And another foul ball behind home. Such a great pitch. And this is where Schoonover doesn't mix in her changeup a ton. She only throws it about 5% of the time. Those five earned runs she gave up in game one were the most earned runs since March 23rd at Florida. Another payoff, the 65th pitch of the day for Schoonover. Misses upstairs, and the base is loaded now with the tying run, Gordon. important right now for Georgia to not help Stephanie Schoonover out and chase pitches like the way that they did back in the top of the first inning when they had an opportunity. Saw Gordon chase that first pitch and then take the second. Base is loaded one down and a four run deficit for the Bulldogs who are trying to avoid their third consecutive SEC series loss. Both games coming into the day highly competitive in this series. And a strikeout for Schoonover. That is her fourth. And the tough part about three of the four of these strikeouts is that they've chased pitches that never even really start as a strike that are just so far out of the strike zone. Another big strikeout for Schoonover. They have all come in high leverage situations. As Sydney Kuma takes the swing at the first pitch. Now you look back to the first inning, back to back strikeouts with runners at the corners. Then in the second inning, two on and a strikeout to get her first out. And now with the bases loaded, a strikeout, and she's one out away from getting out of the jam.
Going back to that rise ball again, and Georgia is just chasing it. Known for that screwball, we said that that's the pitch, actually, when you look at her pitch usage that she likes to use the most. So inside, right at the knees, or right belt high, these right-handed hitters. But this rise ball is getting quite a few swing and misses. And it's interesting because we saw this Georgia team draw six walks against Schoonover on Friday night. And time called behind home. A time violation. Time violation on the pitcher. It's a ball on the batter. Two balls, two strikes. And now Rachel Lawson's popped out of the dugout again. The pitch clock has been in implemented in the game, but hasn't really been a huge issue this year for any of the series that you and I have covered. Well, I think what is confusing right now is that it looked like Schoonover had called time, and it seemed like she was given a timeout. And you get one timeout as a pitcher and one timeout as a hitter per at bat, okay? So it seemed like Schoonover wasn't happy with the call, wasn't happy with something that was going on. She stepped off. It seemed like she was granted time, but third base umpire said that the pitch clock had just continued on, and so it will be a ball on Kuma. 2-2. Two -two. Schoonover gets a strikeout anyway. Back to back to end the inning. All five of her strikes. State hopping the top 10 in RPI at times this year. Lexi Kilfoyle for Oklahoma State through two shutouts against Texas at home. Remember, Texas is a team that won the series against Oklahoma. Lexi Kilfoyle beat Texas twice with that drop ball and has looked really good. So between Kennedy, Mullins, Pickens, um, and I'm missing one that I just said, and Kilfoyle, Kilfoyle. thank you. Yep. I mean, those are three pitchers that are must-watch softball whenever they're in the circle with their team. Some of the best ERAs in the country. This Georgia team faced Kennedy earlier in the year in the non-conference. They trail Kentucky here 4-0 in the bottom of the third. And each of those pitchers have different strengths, too. Of course, Nigel Kennedy is known for her explosive rise ball. We'll see her next weekend against LA or against UCLA. And then Kilfoyle, known for that drop ball. Pickens has a phenomenal changeup, and she'll hum it in there at 74. One down in the third on a ground out to Sid Kuma. The game starts in the circle, Matt, and you have to have a pitcher that you feel like you can trust. And those pitchers are not only pitchers that you can trust, that they can just dominate hitters day in and day out. Allie Hutchins. Nobody on one down. And she is hit. And Hutchins will head to first. That is the third hit batter of the day by this Georgia pitching staff. Again, trying to work that up and in on the hands. It's going to hurt. So two hit batters by Madison Kerpix in the first inning. Remember, she got the start today. And then Shelby Walters came in to relieve with two outs in the first. And has been in the circle since for a Georgia team that is still searching for answers at the plate. And you referenced the importance of pitching and defense. How good has Kentucky's pitching been in high leverage spots by Stephanie Schoonover this afternoon? That has been the difference in the game when you look at the score and the amount of opportunities that Georgia has had. They have left seven runners on base. One, two to Hamilton. Lined down the line in right field, giving Chase his Kearney, and she'll get there, making the snow cone catch in foul territory. What a play by Jada Kearney, two down. Jada Kearney has been playing a good right field in SEC play. She's made 
a lot of plays that the tester had to come a long way for this one and didn't give up on it. That wind helped it get a little bit closer to her and instead of further away, kept it moving toward her. Blowing across the field from right to left. Runner in scoring position for Cassie Reasoner. Well, and that's been a highlight of Georgia's season has been their defense. Really, their fielding percentage entering this game is 977, both overall in the year and also in SEC plays. So their defense is translating to SEC play. It's something that they've been able to rely on. And another pop-up will get Walters out of the inning. So she pitches around the top of the fourth for UK, joined by Tony Baldwin. Coach, your team has had opportunities in this game at the plate. You leave the bases loaded last inning. What are you liking from your hitters, and what's that next step to get some runs across the board? Well, you know, back in my days at Butler University, I took this class called Statistics, and the law averages should start to go in our way here pretty soon. <laughs> um, so, you know, ultimately, we're doing the right things to get the people on and then not sustaining our discipline when we get uh, we get those runners on. So. We got to do a little bit better on our pitch selection, timing the ball, getting our swing off. Um, you know, if it was a three inning game, we'd be in trouble, but we'll, we'll see if we can play all seven and see what happens. Coach, we've seen Shelby Walters kind of be your hot hand the past couple of weekends, and she's been looking good. What does she bring your team in the circle? Well, at her best, she's really competitive, and our team feeds off her energy. Uh, when she's out there competing, you know, I, I always say when you have a lion in the circle, the rest of your team feels like they're lions too. And, uh, uh, so far, she's doing a good job with that. Coach, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Leading off. So Tony Baldwin's team will come back to the plate here in the fourth with Emily Digby, the freshman who has homered in this series and has brought the energy at the dish as of late. Looks at strike one from Stephanie Schoonover who has five strikeouts in the game, all of them with runners in scoring position. It's not easy to go against the same team twice in a weekend and to be the ace that is relied upon two games and one weekend against a top ranked team in SEC play. And that's what a lot of the aces that you see in SEC, it's what's put upon them is to essentially try to go out there and win a Super Regional every weekend or to try to win two of three games every weekend. Pop up right side of the infield. It's Reasoner putting it away, one down. And Schoonover has been really, so balls that are being put in play against her since that Florida series are easier pop-ups like we're just fielded there or not as hard hit ground balls that are getting through the infield that give your defense an easier chance to make a play back behind you. So she's not getting as many strikeouts, but she's able to rely on her defense more to make more plays. And we had a chance to chat with her head coach, Rachel Lawson, before the game today. And you asked what's been the biggest difference from leading up to that Florida series to after the Florida series. And Rachel Lawson told us just that. It's that Stephanie Schoonover isn't trying to do too much. She's just pitching, relying on her defense to make plays behind her. And she's just a competitor, kind of like how Tony Baldwin was talking about Shelby Walters. I think that you kind of have that same feel with Stephanie Schoonover, too. She is in it to compete in the 180 pitch games that she's going to throw or in the 10, 12 pitch at bat. She's somebody that you just know is going to give your, her all every single pitch and fight for you. She wants the ball every game. She wants to pitch more. Flair to second, and it's Reasoner for back-to-back -back outs for the Wildcats. Countdown. Ace is clear for Dallas Goodnight and two down in the fourth. Well, and when you dive into those numbers a little bit more past the Florida series, it's been her different pitch usage that has stood out too. Before the Florida series, or through the Florida series, I should say, relied on her screwball a little bit more. 
And then since the Florida series, she's actually thrown her rise ball the most out of any of her pitches. So using her rise ball more. And then when she's used her screwball, the batting average against it has gone down 150 points. So using her screwball, maybe her ball would be considered her best pitch more effectively as of late. And I think that you can see it with the way that Kentucky is playing and getting these wins and in every game. I have to believe it's because of the way that Stephanie Schoonover is pitching. And the fact, too, you know, they're hitting a few more home runs. That never hurts <laughs> either. But their offense feels like the Schoonover in the circle and a, a deep Kentucky pitching staff that they have a chance to win. Certainly the way she's pitched today. 1-2 to good night. It's not like she hasn't been in trouble at points in this game. Seven runners left the board for Georgia. They have tested Schoonover in every inning until now. Working on her sixth strikeout. The previous five coming with runners in scoring position. And she just misses the inside corner. Ball Kentucky, two. Yeah, Kentucky fans not happy. That looked a little bit inside to me, but for all these fans in blue here today, they wanted that call. Another great crowd at John Crop Stadium, the 2-2. There have been good crowds for all three games in this series. And again, you look at Kentucky's 4-10 conference record and you think, how could this be that competitive given Georgia's number next to their name? But Kentucky has won some high-level games, both in the non-con and in the conference, and their ace is dealing. Six strike. Mitchell Lawson, coach Stephanie Schoonover, has been put in some high leverage yeah. positions in this game and come up each and every time. What's impressed you about her in the circle this afternoon? Well, you're right. High leverage, a lot of wind, awesome uh, team she's facing, and she just like buckles down and makes it happen. So really impressed with her toughness. Coach, going back to even that last week in the last series that you guys played about uh, against A&M and into this series, your offense just ripping the ball, ton of home runs. What's been the difference to create some more of that power for you? Well, we've kind of had that power all year. So to be honest with you, our coaches do a good job with preparation. Our team's very coachable. So, you know, we just get after it during the week, and then you hope for the best on game day. <laughs> well, it's worked you know out well I mean? today, yeah. Coach. Appreciate your <laughs> time. Gonna... Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Go Cats. A 4 nothing lead for the Wildcats, and, and they've manufactured runs again today, Amanda. We talked about it early in the game when they scored seven in game one against Georgia on Friday night. Just applying pressure, be it stolen bases, walks, singles, stringing together some home runs. They've had a little bit of everything in this game today. And they lead it four zip as Shelby Walters is back in the circle for Georgia. Lauren Borzaleri leading things off for the Wildcats in the nine spot. It is a Kentucky team that is looking for their first series win against Georgia since 2012. Unranked at the moment, though if they get a win here, that might change. 26 in the RPI coming into the weekend. wins against the RPI top 25 and working on number seven here trying to bolster that NCAA at large resume which is already super strong given their strength of schedule. Borzileri a shot to left field back on it is good one see you later a home run for Lauren Borzileri five zip cats. Gotta feel good when you get home run production out of your nine hole, Ed. 
Kentucky has just been swinging the bat so big. I know that Rachel Lawson said that we are a home run hitting team, and they had been, but before that A&M series, they just hadn't been hitting as many home runs in bunches the way that they hit in the series in College Station and then the series here in Lexington. Their bats just seem to be really breaking open big. And a flare in the left field by Riley Smith keeps the rally going in the fourth. Third straight time aboard today by Riley Smith, who has been grinning from ear to ear since this series started. That was the last. We asked Rachel Lawson before the game, you know, you've cycled your leadoff hitters throughout the course of the season. Aaron Koffel, one of those at the plate now. But with the way Riley Smith has hit, at the top of your order. You're gonna to continue to roll with her. And she sort of looked at us and said, I kind of have to <laughs> at this point, with as good as she has been at the top of the order. And you can tell she's just having fun playing the game. Those are best moments as an athlete, as a softball player, is just when you're being loose and letting the game come to you. You're not pressuring yourself too much. Riley Smith has just fit right into that leadoff spot. It's so interesting you bring that up, Amanda, with Aaron Koffel at the plate, of course, played in the 2023 Pan Am Games with Team USA. And when she was asked, you know, what did you take away from that experience? She said, I got to play with legends in their 30s, still playing softball, loving what they do, and trusting the work that they have put in on a snap throw down to first, Smith back to the bag in time. This Kentucky team is starting to embody that they are all having fun one through nine coach Lawson says that Aaron Koffel came here as a dreamer she works so hard but she also dreams big but puts in the work to go into those big dreams 3-1 down the line and left and off the base of the wall Smith will scamper into third on a double by Aaron Koffel and the hits just keep on coming for the Wildcats. Also said about Aaron Koffel that she's just a leader. I mean, that pitch was about a ball off the plate up and in her hands, and she's still got her barrel to that pitch. The run rule now starting to maybe creep into your minds if you're the Wildcats. Leading five zip. And Taylor Ebbs, who has already homered twice in the series, including a home run in the second inning at the plate. Oh, one from Bacchus. Bacchus can throw that change up in any count. The situation that Chelsea Wilkinson, the pitching coach for Georgia and Georgia get in is just not being too predictable with that change up. And it's tough when it's a pitcher's best pitch. You want to be able to throw it all the time, but you also want to not make it something that the hitter can sit on and predict and start to guess that it's coming in certain counts. Well, particularly on a staff that throws more change-ups than any Power 5 team in the country. So the book is out at this point on the main three, Madison Kerpik, Shelby Walters, and Lily Backus. Or 2-2. Swing and a miss, strike three in the first out of the inning, a strikeout of Taylor Ebbs, one down. And that was the changeup. When Lily Back is pitching, it's not a matter of if, but it's a matter of when in the at-bat that she's going to throw it. Perfectly placed changeup, starts at the knees, and then dives down right on the corner. It's exactly what Backus needed. That's exactly what Georgia needed. Most changeups thrown that you just mentioned has been Georgia at the top of that list. And this is among Power 5 schools thrown about 200 more than the second place team there at UCF. And that's because all three of their pitchers that get the majority of the innings have a very effective changeup. Here's Peyton Plotz, lays off the off speed. Uh, Lily Backus started the year super hot, and we saw Georgia in their SEC opener against Alabama. Tony Baldwin said she was the most dialed in of the three 
on his staff. Has struggled a little bit over the last couple of weeks. Part of that was adjustments that hitters have made. But Tony Baldwin really credited Chelsea Wilkinson, the pitching coach for Georgia, for helping Lily Backus make small mechanical adjustments on a hot play at third by Sarah Mosley, two away. And what we've seen in the series now, Amanda, is Lily Backus has been their most consistent in the circle now in her third appearance. Yeah, look at the way that she's just grown all throughout her career. Her first two years were at North Carolina, where you can tell she had some bumps along the way, and they relied on her heavily, especially in her sophomore year last year in 2023. But just has grown every year. Another very coachable player, and even so coachable that they're having to make some mechanical adjustments mid-season this past week with Chelsea Wilkinson, in particular, in particular on her curveball. She was stepping a little bit open with that curveball, and so trying to get her back stepping straight back on her power line with that curveball to create a better location, better spin, and better arm slot for her to throw that pitch. 1-1 one, one count to Grace Lorson. Fly ball, center field. Drifting underneath is good night. And Backus shuts the door with two on it. And remember, they went undefeated a season ago. Maybe that's part of the alarm sounding, is just how dominant they were last year. Yeah, it's, I mean, what they've been able to do for the past three years is incredibly impressive. And kind of setting a standard, right, for how to play the game, how to pitch, how to play defense, how to make a just unstoppable offense at times. But series loss in Austin to Texas and then lost a game at home to BYU, which was a bit of a shocker. The Definitely. Texas series, maybe not so much, right. but the BYU game, yes. And I think that's why it starts to stand out a little bit more because Oklahoma looks a little bit more human than they have <laughs> when they've won the past three national championships. And I think that remember, Louisiana was the team that gave them their first loss earlier in the season at home at Love's Field. And I think that when you see a team do that, knock them off after winning 71 straight games, it kind of gives everybody else a little bit of confidence, like, hey, we can do it too. They put their cleats on just like us. 2-2 Two -two to Sydney Chambly. Swing and a miss. Seven strikeouts for Stephanie Schoonover. One down in the fifth. But it's not just been Oklahoma in the top ten that has gotten upset. I mean, they're not the only ones. It's been all throughout the top ten. Seven of the top ten teams have been upset this week. Uh, going to Oklahoma, of course. Duke lost to Campbell. Tennessee lost to Mississippi State. They got run ruled. Oklahoma State lost to Iowa State twice. LSU lost to Auburn in game one of that series, and then Lynch rebounded with that no-hitter that we mentioned. Just that week, I feel like that everybody kind of beats up on everybody. Friday night, it was like a who's who of upsetting in Division I softball. We saw it here. Kentucky handing Georgia its first loss to a non-ranked opponent this season, and now staring down Potentially two in the same series are the Bulldogs. Down five zip here in the top of the fifth as Kearney scorches it to Borzaleri two away. Well, and I think that what's going to happen, Matt, is that it's just going to make regionals and super regionals and the World Series just be insane. There's so much parity. We've said it, I feel like, since we got back from the shortened COVID year in 2020 and I feel like every year there's just been more and more and more parity throughout our sport. That's why it's going to make regionals very interesting and super is just so much fun. Super regionals is actually my favorite weekend. I love of the super whole regional year. Weekend. The whole year. Even more than World Series I think. Well, there Kentucky's was no, been to a few. They have. And there was no shortage of dramatics in last year's super. I just think back to that McNeese State team. They were right there and couldn't quite close it out. But it showed you the parity that we're now starting to see throughout Division One, not just at the power conference level. 
Well, I mean, think about a team like Kentucky, who sits at an RPI right now of 26. And there's a lot of season left. I mean, they could win out for the rest of the season and try to hop into and grab a top 16 national seed. But it's looking like right now that Kentucky would be on the road for regionals. So having to face a Kentucky team, you see the bracket show up, and Kentucky is coming to you with Stephanie Schoonover and Aaron Koffel and this team that's just busting out offensively and playing really well together here at the end of the season. I mean, you wouldn't want to see them in your bracket at your regional. Two, two to Jaden Goodwin. Rings are up on the inside corner. One, two, three oh, inning for game. And today, Kentucky in the driver's seat, leading five, nothing in the bottom of the fifth. That actually hit her, but Marty Abazician is going to keep her in the box, saying that that pitch was in the river. Much to the surprise of Allie Hutchins. But it's also not only been the team that scored first, it's been the team that's hit the most home runs in the game that has gone on to win each game up to this point. And Kentucky's offense just in control. And when you're scoring in three of the four innings, when you're scoring in the majority of the innings that you're coming up to bat, it just takes so much pressure off your pitcher, your defense, and puts a lot of pressure on the other team. Coming into the day, Kentucky was seventh in the SEC in home runs. Fourth in doubles, and they continue to pile on in extra base hits. We saw a home run and a double in the last inning. And it goes back to what Rachel Lawson told us during our interview with her in the fourth inning. We've swung the bat well all season, but what we're seeing now is they're stringing it together multiple times in the same inning, and it's resulting in big innings at the plate for Kentucky. And they hit 45 home runs last year. 19 came from Coughlin. So 19 of the 45 home runs that they hit were from one person. And this year, they've already hit 57 home runs. And Aaron Coughlin has hit just 12. I say just 12. But in comparison <laughs> to last year, when you're looking at the percentage, you're seeing production from, you know, big, powerful production for more hitters than just Darren Koffel. Line drive up the middle and a leadoff base hit for Allie Hutchins. After the hit by pitch was wiped away, she gets on board anyway. Well, it's just been good execution, Matt. You've seen them hit the home run. You've seen them get their leadoff hitter on. You've seen them hit a sack fly, an RBI single. I mean, they're scoring in a lot of different ways, and they're not just relying on the long ball to put runs on the board. Nobody out, one on for Carissa Hamilton. Run rule in effect here. Kentucky with a 5-0 lead. If they can get to 8, they can put this away. Pop-up caught on a diving play by Sarah Gordon. One down. Popping out of her stance behind home plate. And yeah, Georgia wow. uses three different catchers back behind the plate. Sarah Gordon gets a start today for the first time this series and tracks down a ball that was in the air for a while. And it just seemed like as soon as that ball went in the air, Sarah Gordon was determined to go catch it. Competitive back behind the plate, a big get for Georgia in the transfer portal to get Sarah Gordon to their team. A lot of success last year at Louisville. That's the type of play you have to make to stay in this game. Aaron Thulin gets hit on the first pitch by Lily Backus. And now two aboard and one down for Lauren Borzilleri, who homered in her last at bat. Just attack them, bit on time, and hit a mark. She has the chance to end this game right here. Two on and one down, and a 5-0 lead. 
Kentucky playing for their first series win against Georgia since 2012. And their second SEC series win of the season. And it could be one of those season-defining series wins. 0-2 to second base. Kuma bobbles it. And the throw to second is in time as Armistead was covering. And Thulin had to sort of squirt out of the way of Kuma, who was in the path. Fortunate there after Kuma bobbled it to get the runner at second base. Kuma was thinking double play all the way, got a little ahead of herself, and good job of sticking with the play as soon as that ball went to the ground, and she backhanded it to get the force out at second, so at least they were able to get an out on that play, an important second out in the setting with the top of the lineup coming up. And Riley Smith, who is three for three today with a pair of singles and a double. Seven hits in the series. Coach Lawson is always talking about how strong Riley Smith is. So much power, even in the weight room with the amount that she squats and can bench and power clean. Two all flutters in for a strike. Had an exceptional fall, and I mean, you, you see her increases in extra base hits, and in average, last year she hit 279. And this year she's hitting almost 100 points higher. In her final year of college softball, that's the way you want to go out, and has found a home, seemingly, in the leadoff spot for a Kentucky team that's been searching for it all year. Goes after the 3-1, and a full count now from Lily Backus. Potential game-winning run at the plate. The payoff from Backus. In the center field and down. One run is in on the RBI single from Riley Smith, who is now four for four on the afternoon. There are just not many days as a college softball player that you're going to get a chance to go four for four. Her eighth hit of this series, Riley Smith, has just absolutely been on fire, hitting in that leadoff spot for Kentucky as they have searched for an answer there, and I think they found one. Aaron Koffel looks at ball one. So the game-winning run potentially on base in the form of Riley Smith, who has some serious speed. We saw her steal two bags on night one of this series on Friday night. Yeah, you got to be really careful here with Aaron Koffel, especially going inside like that. When you look at the majority of her home runs that she's had at Kentucky, most have come toward the left side or middle of the field. A lot of poolside power. You mean like the one we saw the other night, which went 302 feet over the scoreboard in left field? Literally, over the scoreboard, and just is the longest home run that I feel like anybody who had seen it that night had seen hit ever. I mean, everybody was talking about that home run. Over the scoreboard, there's that fence that is beyond like the real fence. You can kind of see it. it's a black fence behind the scoreboard. It hit that fence halfway up. Pop up, playable in foul territory. It's Digby gloving to get out of the inning. So Georgia still with a chance. Kentucky strands too. They lead it by six. Today, the second time they see her. And she has retired eight in a row as she faces Sarah Mosley to begin the sixth. And to your point, five of her eight strikeouts have come with runners in scoring position. She has been dialed in in the high leverage spots this afternoon. It's why her team leads it by six. Mosley crushed to center, and it's off the wall but quickly turned back in by Jenna Blanton. 
Holds Mosley to a long leadoff single. That's the third time in this game that Georgia's gotten their leadoff on, but still no runs on the board. It's been all about situational hitting for them and really the lack thereof. One for nine, Georgia is with runners in scoring position. Sarah Gordon, nobody out and a runner on base. Mosley, the first base runner award for Georgia since the third. And Stephanie Schoonover, as we talked about before, loves to rely on that screwball. It's not a lot that you hear about a screwball being a pitcher's main pitch recently. You'll see a change up or rise or drop or even curve. But for Schoonover, she likes to go to that screwball. And when you look at power five pitchers, she's actually thrown the third highest amount of screwballs behind Abby Dunning from Boston College and Alyssa Zavala from Louisville. Schoonover coming this game, 779 screwballs that she's thrown. Uh, Rachel Lawson, when asked, you know, how would you describe Stephanie Schoonover? She said, unafraid. She will go right after you. And she has done that all afternoon against a program in Georgia that has been one of the most powerful hitting teams in the country, not just this year, but over the last four years. Little flare shot right side, and it drops for a base hit for Sarah Gold. Sid Kuma at the plate for Georgia, and she gets hit. And now the bases are loaded for Emily Digby with nobody out. Gosh, how quickly things can change, right? Kentucky had all the momentum, a chance that was looking like with Aaron Koffel up to run rule the game with a home run. And instead now it's Kentucky up by six, but Georgia with the bases loaded after that hit by pitch and no outs. Big opportunity here for Georgia. It is Lindy Ray Davis, who for a good chunk of this season hit in the leadoff spot, not getting the start today. Instead, it's been Sarah Gordon behind the plate. So the first at bat of the day for Lindy Ray Davis comes as a pinch hitter with the bases loaded and nobody out in the sixth. Well, Lindy Ray Davis has had a couple of different roles this season. Earlier on, she had some pitch hit opportunities, and we've also seen her be an everyday starter within this season. And earlier this season, even back in the Clearwater tournament, had a pinch hit home run in one of the games that I was calling to get Georgia back into the game. So hasn't hit you know the highest number of home runs in the Georgia team, but it's just seemed like the home runs that she's hit have been crucial bombs to get Georgia back into the game or to give them a lead. Ahead in the count, 2-1. Georgia coming off 2-1 series losses to Arkansas and Tennessee. Three and one. If you're wondering, what that noise is in the background that's coming from the Georgia dugout. It is Madison Kerpix, actually, who was our starting pitcher for Georgia. That noise right there. You mean the one where she sounds like a dolphin? Yeah, that's that's the one. <laughs> it is uh, a Madison Kerpix special. No shortage of surprises on the softball diamond from week to week in the SEC. Full count. Bases loaded, nobody out for Georgia, who has had multiple chances in this game. They have left seven runners aboard. And it's a Georgia team that came into the season picked second in the SEC behind only Tennessee has not gone the way that Tony Baldwin and his staff thought it might have over the first half of the season. But still a lot of softball to play. And he told us coming into the weekend that the team got together and had a meeting and said, okay, the first half of the season is past us. There's nothing we can do about that. 
We've got three more weekends ahead of us to try and win as many games as possible and give ourselves a chance in the SEC tournament, the regional, and the super. Lindy Ray Davis flares the 3-2 into left and caught on the run in foul territory by Smith as Mosley tags up from third and Georgia finally on the board here in the sixth. see another pinch hitter and it will be Jaden Fields in the nine spot for Ellie Armistead and it's interesting Amanda you played on teams that had high expectations you played in a women's college world series how difficult is it when the season doesn't start off the way you think it might at least conference play well, what's hard is not to overreact to think that just because how you play the first week of February or halfway through in April, that that's how you're going to be playing in May and in the postseason. And you just start to feel tight and start to press and start to try so hard to make it happen. And everybody kind of starts to feed off of each other with that same mindset, especially when you have a lot of seniors that have high expectations. So it's easy to kind of get down pretty quickly, but... In the same breath, Matt, I think that you have to take a step back and know there's a lot of season left. And as Tony Baldwin was saying about the law of averages, that things do just start to kind of even themselves out and work themselves out. It's a game of balance. Jaden Fields at the plate. On a check swing, went around, according to the third base umpire, Phil Friels. Pinch runner for Sarah Gordon at second base. It's Hannah Devilla. Kuma at first. And the 0-2 rings up fields on the inside corner. Nine strikeouts for Stephanie Schoonover. You know, it's not very often, especially what seems like this season, that the top of the strike zone gets called, but Stephanie Schoonover gets the call right at the letters, gets that rise ball. Love to see it. Look, Matt, you have heard me talk about it for the past few weeks. The strike zone has just seemed really small, especially in SEC play. And in particular, that the top of the strike zone has not been getting called the way that it's written in the rule book. And love to see the top and the bottom of the zone getting called for these pitchers. The hitters are so good and so tough to go up against that you want to see them get the top. One out of Dallas. Good night into the mid of Vanessa Nesby, and that ends the inning. Bases loaded, nobody out. It's 7 Eastern on SEC Network from Tuscaloosa. As we welcome you back to Lexington. Bottom of the sixth, Kentucky leads Georgia 6-1 in the series finale and rubber match on a gorgeous Sunday afternoon. Lily Backus back in the circle, the third pitcher used this afternoon by Georgia head coach Tony Baldwin. And it has been the Wildcats both today and on night one, a game in which they won, just manufacturing runs, finding ways to move runners over and get runners across. And we've seen that again here this afternoon. Rio to Vanessa Nesby. And she draws a leadoff walk in her first at bat of the game. Well, hey, coming up next on ESPN2, it is game two of the Aggies and the Tide. And if you're looking for that game right now, you can find it over on ESPN News. We will get you there on ESPN2 at the conclusion of our game here in Lexington. Should be a good one. Kayla Beaver threw a shutout yesterday against AM. Always tough to go into Tuscaloosa and play. That environment should be rocking this afternoon. Bama has lost series to both of these teams, Georgia and Kentucky. In fact, that was the first series win in the SEC of the season for the Wildcats. 
Hopper to first, Digby goes to second and a stretch by Ellie Armistead to get the lead runner Nesby. That is heads up by the freshman over at first base, one down. Emily Digby actually recruited as a shortstop. They put her at first base for the first time this year and as a freshman can move really well. like the way that she plays over there at first base. Very athletic. Tony Baldwin told us, we just recruit shortstops and then figure it out later. Six of the seven players they have signed for next year primarily play shortstop. You see a lot of coaches recruit like that because you know that shortstop is going to have good hands, they're going to be athletic, have good range, good arms, and then you can move them to a different spot, just like they've done with Digby. And that's why it's so important just to be open to playing different positions, too, at any age, not to get locked in and just say, well, I'm only a shortstop, and if I'm not going to play there, then I'm going to be a bad teammate or I, I don't want to play. You have to be open to playing a, a different spot and earning time there, too. Tony Baldwin told us the coaching staff has a nickname for Emily Digby. They call her Tonic Water because she goes with everything. To your point, when they asked her to move from shortstop to first to base, she said, okay, when do I start? And dove head first into learning the position and the nuances of playing up the first base line. One, two, a pop up left side. Armistead shielding the sun and makes the play two away. A night countdown. And a first pitch swing from Jenna Blanton. Two outs and a runner on for Kentucky. And a five run lead in the rubber match with Georgia. Would be Kentucky's seventh win against an RPI top 25 team this year. And Rachel Lawson said, look, with some young players, players playing in different positions this season, different batting order, the schedule has produced some stress at times. But Amanda, they seem to be figuring it out here as that gets under Ellie Armistead at short. And the inning continues. Here is Carissa Hamilton with two on. mentioned the run roll last inning and now still Kentucky one swing away from run rolling Georgia right now if you can hit a home run be up by eight in this game it also mentioned too you know Georgia has left nine runners on base but Kentucky has left eight they potentially could have more runs on the board and so could Georgia a lot of opportunities back to Armistead and a flip to third at Mosley start of the series working on her fifth complete game in the last six outings. And it's Sydney Chambly leading things off with a bunt attempt that dribbles foul. Yeah, you saw her last weekend against A&M get even better in her second start too. There was shutout against A&M at College Station last weekend in game three. And you're seeing her do even better in game three here the second time that Georgia has faced her. And that's what you know makes her so tough is that she can throw a different game plan at hitters two different times in a weekend, three different times in a weekend. She can vary the amount that she's using her rise ball, her screw ball, and then of course the pitch calling by Rachel Lawson is always gonna be top notch. She watches a ton of film. to try to give hitters a different look the second time through. Chambly into left field, tracking it is Smith, and she gets there, crashing into the wall in foul territory. One down in the seventh. Is she having a series or what? Seems like Kentucky is clicking, and Riley Smith has been a big part of it. Tracking that ball down, and especially it's not easy to be an outfielder with the wins that we've seen today. Any ball in the air is just a chore to get. There is Jada Kearney. High fly ball left field. That is a no doubter over the scoreboard for Jada Kearney. 
Don't count the Bulldogs out just yet. Good to see her get going and get her swing off here. Clearly looking for that inside corner, gets it out in front and stays behind it. I mean, that was an absolute bomb over the scoreboard. Wow, that's a lot of power for Jada Kearney. Solo home run to give Georgia those two runs. Base is clear for Jaden Goodwin. And she looks at ball one. Georgia has left nine runners aboard in this game. They have struck out five times with runners in scoring position. The 1-0 to Goodwin. Imagine one or two of those at bats leading to runs. That home run right there maybe ties the game or gives Georgia the lead. Instead, they trail by four with Goodwin, Mosley, and Gordon still due up in the inning. Well, and we had mentioned this earlier in the game, but the fact that Georgia has given up more home runs than they've hit has seemingly caused some issues. And it's not that you have to hit home runs in order to win, but it's that teams that are hitting home runs against them are hitting multi-run home runs, three-run home run, three-run home run against Tennessee when they lost game three. And then just scoring runs in bunches against them, but not being able to score runs in bunches when they have the opportunity to do so. Got down four nothing after the first two innings. Kentucky plating two in each of the first two. And the two two is flown out to left. Smith on the track, shielding the sun, two away. Four for four at the plate is Riley Smith this afternoon and has now produced the first two outs of the seventh in the field for the Wildcats. She let off the game with a single and just set the tone, set the momentum from at bat number one. You mentioned she has four hits. Kentucky has nine hits on the day and four have been off of her bat. Sarah Mosley with Georgia down to its final out. Eight strikeouts this afternoon for Stephanie Schoonover in her second start in the series. And with a win this afternoon, Kentucky will pick up their second series win in the SEC, having already beat a top 25 Alabama team. Trying to continue to bolster their NCAA tournament resume and gain some momentum in league play as we have turned to the back half of the slate and maybe put themselves in better positioning for SEC tournament seeding. That goes a long way too. And still quite a few weekends left and usually comes down to that final weekend to see the SEC tournament seeds, which in preparation mode is always tough before the SEC tournament if you're working it like me. And Kentucky's upcoming schedule. Auburn, by the way, won against LSU, won the series against LSU, their first series win. And still plenty of opportunities for the Wildcats to pick up top 25 wins. That was a point of emphasis for Rachel Lawson coming into this series. One strike away from taking the series from Georgia. The 2-2. Two -two. And Mosley continues the inning for the Bulldogs. 136 pitches for Schoonover this afternoon. I mean, you've got to give it to Georgia. They've made her throw a lot of pitches, a lot of deep at bats, a lot of three ball counts. And a lot of runners on base just have not been able to push him across. So here is Sarah Gordon. And time called by Schoonover, and it is granted. She has faced six full counts this afternoon as Schoonover. So Kentucky has a 
beware of cats sign that they handmade <laughs> in their dugout. And that's because you'll see oftentimes in Georgia's dugout, they have a real beware of dog or dogs, dog uh, sign that they have in the dugout. Love that. A rivalry as old as time, cats and dogs. There, oh, there, there it, is. it is. That's the Georgia one. And then there is the Kentucky one. It's Glover. There is the one-one to Gordon. You a dog person or cat person? Um, you know, with the exception of talking, or not talking about Kentucky <laughs> and Georgia, I'm more of a dog person. Gotcha. How about you? I'd say dog. Yeah. Okay. I have kids, so I don't need pets. Here's the one-two to Sarah Gordon. This is upstairs. Georgia trying to draw this out. They have had plenty of opportunities this afternoon, but each time they've knocked on the door, it's been schoon over to shut it abruptly. And we will have back-to-back -back full counts with two outs in the seventh. And Schoonover was ready to celebrate this strikeout, but looked a little bit inside to me. Time called behind home. I believe the fans might have just gotten a warning, perhaps. And now they're going to be asked not to stand or stomp their feet on the bleachers. We will have a call up to the press box here and await an announcement. Rachel Lawson out of the dugout. She's wanting an explanation. Yeah, not exactly sure what Marty Abazition is making the call up about. Well, if it was about stopping the feet on the bleachers, it just got a whole heck of a lot louder. Payoff pitch, two down in the seventh. Fly ball, foul territory out of play. I don't think I've ever seen that before. If in fact it was about not stomping on the bleachers, but now everybody at John Crop Stadium in unison, stomping on the bleachers. One strike away from their first series win against Georgia since 2012. The payoff. Up the middle and into center field, and the inning continues on a two-out single by Sarah Gordon. At this point, you have two outs in the top of the seventh inning. You're down by four runs. I mean, you absolutely hope for a miracle, Matt, but I think that more so you just want to leave here feeling a little bit better about your at-bats and about your offense when you leave here. So if you score one run in the city and two runs in the city, you just want to put better at-bats together than what we've seen out of Georgia so far in this game. Kuma has been hit by Schoonover twice in this game. No hits for the starting second baseman for Georgia who looks at strike one. And this is Schoonover's game in the circle. Nobody warming in the Kentucky bullpen as she gets closer to 150 pitches on the afternoon. So just because I texted Kentucky SID Chris Scholes about what Marty Abazition said to clarify, because I'm sure everybody was wondering, he thought, Marty did, that Kentucky was audibly pumping crowd noise in between pitches, which Chris says they don't actually have the ability to do. High hopper, middle of the infield, backhanded by Tobias. No play at any bag. And the bases are loaded for Georgia in the seventh. And these at bats now are just feisty from Georgia. And all of a sudden, you're one swing away from tying up this game. Hit this hard into the ground and created that big hop. And Tobias did a good job of just keeping this ball on the infield, keep it from going to the outfield. Good hustle. And I mean, this little rally here that Georgia is putting together, Rachel Lawson is going to go out, talk to the Cats, and try to calm them down and get this lost out. 
good clarification, by the way, from Chris Scholes, because you could see confusion in the stands behind home plate. The fans thought Marty Abazician was telling them that they were not allowed to cheer. They have been cheering loudly because they have had two outs for the last three batters. And now Georgia, with the tying run at the plate in the form of Emily Digby, who has homered in this series. I mean, such a big opportunity for this freshman. And 6 4 3 charts will do a win probability right. And I would have to believe that at this point in the game, entering the seventh inning, the win probability percentage for Kentucky going this inning has to be something like 98, 97%. So when you think about how big of an at bat this is, and that Emily Digby would have an opportunity to tie up this game. You talk about a major swing that you just don't see very often. It is a Georgia team trying to flip the script here in the second half of SEC play. 0-1, high pop up, shallow center field, and Blanton puts it away. Kentucky wins their first series against Georgia since